Um, I'm Brett Klein with Eisenhower Health uh, here in our Marketing and Public Relations Department. And um, if you've tuned into any of these things previously, last couple of years, you've seen my face. Um, and I'm not the speaker, thankfully. <laughs> we have professionals that are doing all that work for us tonight. And uh, so a uh, few housekeeping rules. Um, everyone, as you enter, is muted and your video is off. Um, please stay muted until the end of the presentation where we'll open up for live Q&A. Um, but during, feel free to use the chat feature and I will monitor that and I will relay those questions to the doctor as he asks, or we will start with those at the, uh, at the end. But we will um, give ample time at the end for live Q&A and or chat so you can get your questions answered. And with that, I'd like to uh, bring on board uh, Dr. Dustin Briggs, MD, with our Desert Orthopedic Center. Um, he is our second week of talking about hip and knee replacement. Um, some of you may have joined us last week with Dr. Bogosian um, for a very great conversation on recovery and a lot of other aspects. So Dr. Briggs is going to cover a multitude of different things and tell you more about himself, which I'll let him do, and then uh, we'll get moving. So Dr. Briggs, it's all yours, sir. And we'll admit a few more people into the room. It's all you. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Late afternoon, I guess. Uh, Brett, thank you for setting everything up. Um, it's an honor to be here and I'm glad so many of you guys could make it. So um, yeah, my name is Dustin Briggs. Um, I've been living in the Valley now for about four years. Um, I originally did all my training and did my first four years of practice in New Mexico, and then my wife is from here, and so we decided to move here once we had kids, and it's been a great move. And then I joined Desert Orthopedic Center uh, almost a year ago, so January of 2022, and it's been a great, um, been a great move. It's an awesome practice, and um, we're busy. So I'm glad you guys could all uh, come here and learn a little bit more about hip and knee replacement. Um, like Brett said last week, Dr. Bogosian talked about hip and knee replacement more from a recovery side, I'm going to kind of start more from an indication side. So is this surgery right for you? When do you decide to have surgery? Are you a candidate for the surgery? Um, those kind of issues. So um, so the take-home points that are just going into kind of what is arthritis and why do we do these surgeries? What are some of the treatment options we can do, both minor procedures and then the major surgery, you know, the major procedures such as surgery? Um, medications, injections, arthroscopy, and potential injections. Um, and the big pick, the big question is, how do you know when it's time to proceed? So what is arthritis? Arthritis is just um, a term to uh, indicate that the cartilage or the smooth surface at the end of the bone has worn out. So anywhere two bones meet in the body is called a joint, and the bones are covered by smooth articular cartilage. And when that cartilage wears out, we call it arthritis. And when it wears out to the point where you're rubbing bone on bone, that's now severe arthritis, which is typically an indication for a joint replacement. So specific to the hip and knee, there's a, there's a different kind of cartilage too, which acts more as like a stabilizing shock absorber. In the, in the hip, that's the labrum. And in the knee, that's the meniscus. And those are always involved in the arthritic process as well. And they become degenerative and they have tearing in association with the arthritis. So it's a very important to get weight-bearing x-rays when you're being evaluated for hip or knee pain. Um, the weight that we place on our bones collapses the joint space when the cartilage gets thin, and that indicates the arthritis. So non-weight-bearing x-rays are very difficult to, to, for, to evaluate, but the weight-bearing films become very helpful to make the diagnosis. This is a very extreme example of arthritis. Most patients' arthritis isn't this bad, but this is a nice one to show in the discussion such as this, because it's very obvious. This is a post-traumatic arthritis of the knee. And as you can see, um, uh, this right here is the uh, medial joint space of the knee, and that is bone on bone. There's no joint space there, such as here on the lateral side of the knee, where you actually see some space between the bones. So that there is bone on bone arthritis, and there's some bone spurs here on the side. So this really checks all the boxes of very advanced arthritis, and no question this patient's indicated for surgery. When it comes to the knee, typically the patients will drift into a malalignment or kind of deformity, we call it. Um, when the inside part of the knee wears out, such as this picture over here, the knee tends to drift to the outside, and we call that sort of bow-legged, for lack of a better term, and uh, it's called varus arthritis. And then when the knee wears out on the outside part of the joint, it drifts toward the middle and becomes a little knock-kneed or valgus arthritis. And so those are very typical patterns of arthritis. Occasionally the knee will stay 
neutral alignment here straight. And that's, that happens whenever the kneecap has very bad arthritis while rubbing on the femur. So those are kind of the three patterns of arthritis we expect. And then for the hip, very similar. I like this x-ray because this right, this patient is standing and looking at us. And so this is the right hip and this is the left over here. So this right hip has really well-preserved joint space. Uh, but as you can see, this is terrible arthritis. There's no joint space that you can even see. As the cartilage wears thin, the bone becomes susceptible to these little cysts. Um, and so there's cystic changes in really bad arthritis. So this also is very advanced arthritis. This is as bad as it gets. So no question this patient's indicated for hip or knee replacement. Very rarely do we see patients in clinic with this severe of arthritis. Most patients would have a little more subtle findings, but still be candidates for surgery. This is more of a normal x-ray here we're looking at. But So what's the indication for an MRI? Um, in my practice, it's a normal or a near normal weight-bearing x-ray, but patients that still have a lot of pain. So you don't necessarily need an MRI before coming to see us in clinic. Usually the x-ray will, um, will suffice. Now, I occasionally do get an MRI in a patient that has severe arthritis to evaluate the other parts of the knee to see if they may be, may be a candidate for a partial knee replacement. So you've been diagnosed with arthritis, so now what? Well, we don't go straight to surgery. Um, we do medical management first, um, and that includes anti-inflammatories. So there's over-the-counter like ibuprofen, Aleve, those kind of medications. Um, we'll also do some uh, some prescription medications to good meloxicam or Celebrex. Those tend to be a little safer um, on the kidneys in your GI tract. But Tylenol and then physical therapy works well as well. There is a unique um, type of physical therapy called APOS therapy, which I really like, but it's pretty insurance dependent if it's covered. Now we rely pretty heavily on injections to get some temporary or even long-term pain relief. Cortisone injections are pretty classic. We uh, conventionally expect about three months of pain relief. We'll typically start with a cortisone injection, especially if there's bone on bone arthritis or if there's pretty advanced arthritis. If there's just kind of mild to moderate arthritis, sometimes we'll go for a hyaluronic acid injection. This used to be called the rooster comb injection. Now we have more synthetic type um, uh, mixes that we use, uh, but this kind of more enhances like the normal joint environment to uh, more of a supplement type gel injection. And then platelet-rich plasma is, an, is um, gaining some traction as far as a possible injection too. This is where you uh, take some blood, spin it down and get some of the nice healing elements and inject it into the knee. That is an out-of-pocket um, expense for the most part, not covered by insurance. And then I get a lot of questions about stem cell injections. And this technology is really in its infancy. I can't weigh in on it too strongly because there is a big placebo effect in people that are paying thousands of dollars for the injection. So on the well-done randomized studies, it's still a little bit inconclusive as to whether this is effective or not. It is expensive and there's few evidence-based studies. So for the most part, we don't um, recommend it heavily. Although I do think there is a potential for this to be successful in the future. And then arthroscopic debridement. Uh, can't you just clean out my knee uh, is a question I hear a lot. In the context of arthritis, where the joint space is thin, and especially bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, where there's very limited role for arthroscopy. In the scenario where there's normal x-rays, but we get an MRI, and the MRI shows a meniscus tear with an otherwise normal joint, that's when we would consider doing a arthroscopic surgery to address an isolated meniscus tear that's otherwise not involved in the arthritis process. But when there's arthritis present, we tend to uh, not push arthroscopy very hard. It's kind of like pulling the day. So a, a degenerative meniscal tear, scoping that in the context of arthritis is kind of like pulling the dandelions and leaving the thistles. It's not going to take care of all the problems. The caveat to that is if you have a lot of mechanical symptoms, so locking, popping, catching, giving way, if we think that's related to a loose meniscal fragment, occasionally we can consider doing arthroscopy. So that leaves us to major surgery. And obviously it's anxiety provoking. And that's what we're kind of talking about today. How do I know when it's time? So the picture on the um, left before there is arthritis. You can see kind of the erosion of the cartilage and then the knee replacement is pictured there. So a knee replacement is a bit of a misnomer. We don't go in and chop out the whole knee and replace everything. It's essentially replacing the cartilage. So it's more of a resurfacing type procedure. 
But we do resurface the the whole the entire knee in a total knee replacement where the femur meets the tibia. The metal we have metal components that that are directly opposed to the femur and the tibia, and between them we use a plastic spacer. Hip replacement is very similar, but it really is truly a hip replacement. We we replace the entire ball and socket joint. Um, we actually make a cut here across the femoral neck, and we have to replace that bone with metal and plastic. And then similarly, we put a metal hip socket in the hip socket here and line that with plastic as well. So the metal we use is titanium. And then for the most part, the articulating surface, uh, the ball, you know, the femoral head, the ball, and then the liner of the socket is typically made of polyethylene or plastic, and this is usually ceramic. So we have titanium opposed to the bones, and then ceramic on polyethylene is the articulating surface. So in general, these are very predictably successful surgeries. Um, some of the most successful surgeries in all of medicine, actually. And as we said, the re knee replacement is a bit of a misnomer. It's more like a knee resurfacing. And the total hip truly is a hip replacing surgery. So these are the same x-rays we showed earlier of the severe hip arthritis. Then this is what it looks like when we replace the joint. So, you know, we um, we made this cut across the femoral neck here and we have to replace that bone. The way we do that is we anchor a femoral stem down into the femur and off of that is extended into a femoral neck. We place the ball on there. This is This comes in two parts so that we have the ability to make this longer or shorter depending how far the neck fits onto the stem to control the length of the leg. And then we put the hip socket in here. Some people get these screws in the hip socket just for a, some provisional fixation, but ultimately the bone grows into the metal of the stem and the hip socket to basically um, kind of unite that into your skeleton. This is the knee replacement we looked at, or the knee arthritis we looked at previously. And similarly, we trim off the cartilage on the top of the tibia we trim off the cartilage in the top of the femur and that's becomes the knee replacement. There's, it looks like there's space between the metal components because that plastic liner doesn't show up on the x-ray. This is from the side view. You can tell we just kind of trim away the cartilage at the end of the bone and replace that with metal. Occasionally we'll trim the back side of the kneecap off as well and replace that with plastic. I don't always do that in every patient um, if the cartilage on the kneecap otherwise looks good. And there's the kneecap view. If the kneecap looks good and is tracking centrally in the femur, oftentimes I'll leave it. If it looks like it's really worn out or if it's not tracking well, we'll put a plastic cap on the end of it like that. That brings me to partial knee replacement. Some patients are candidates for a slightly less invasive surgery, a partial knee replacement. It's kind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. If the rest of the knee is normal, but there's an isolated part of severe arthritis, some patients do qualify for a partial knee replacement, which theoretically is a less invasive surgery with a quicker recovery and a more natural feel. We tend to do this more in what we call a bimodal distribution. So a very, very young active patient to maybe bridge them to a knee replacement in the future or more an older patient that maybe wants a more quick, you know, a quicker recovery and um, uh, with less chance because they're older of the rest of the knee wearing out over time. But having said that, even someone that's more in their, you know, 60s or 70s that um, we could go either way, some of those patients still do qualify for a partial knee replacement. And this is what a partial knee replacement is. So here we leave the outside part of the knee alone. We leave the inside part of the knee here where the cruciate ligaments are, the ACL and the PCL. And we leave the kneecap alone. And we just resurface the part of the knee that has some arthritis. Similarly, we can do that to the, the kneecap joint or the patellofemoral joint. So where the patella um, rubs on top of the femur, we can just put a little cap on the top of the femur the patella sits in that, we resurface the bottom side of the kneecap and we just do an isolated patellofemoral arthroplasty. So the important thing to know is that once you've made the decision and had the surgery, it really does, you know, this is a, it's a forever joint and we have to take care of it. It is prone to infection even down the road. So a lot of patients have to uh, take antibiotics before dental work. It can still fracture. Um, you know, there can be dislocation. So 
even though we get through the surgery successfully for the rest of your life, we need to be very um, cognizant of any infections that are taking place, treat those very quickly um, and have good bone health and uh, strength. So we avoid fracture going forward. So once we decide to do surgery um, or so this is a, this is a picture of a robot. So this is the Mako um, machine that we use. And I tend to use robotic assisted hip and knee replacements whenever it's approved by the insurance companies. Um, but we do want to have a good sense of what are the potential complications and shortcomings of this replacement? Because that'll obviously help us make the decision of when it's time to have the surgery. We can't make a decision unless we know what we're trying to decide upon. So um, for the most part, seven out of eight patients are very pleased with their result of the knee replacement, although that does leave about one out of eight patients that for whatever reason, we didn't quite meet their expectations. So we do need to take that number seriously. 10 to 15% of patients, we haven't met their expectations. So some of this has to do with optimizing the ligament tension in the knee. If, if it's too unstable, you hear a pop and a click and have lots and lots of swelling. If it's too tight, you feel like a vice is around your knee and you have a little stiffness. So getting that just right is sometimes difficult, uh, but made a little easier with the robotic assistance. It is expected that patients have inability to kneel and lateral knee numbness after surgery. And that's because of the incision. The incision comes directly over the front of the knee. We have to cut through a skin nerve on purpose to get down to the bone. And you, it leaves you with a little numbness on the outside part of the knee and often difficulty kneeling. So that's unfortunately a limitation of even a perfect operation. Um, we do use medications after surgery to avoid uh, blood clot, which can be a high, uh, it, historically it was a higher risk than it is now. Now that we're doing more same day surgery, patients are very active surgery. We have a fast recovery. So the risk has gone down, but it still does exist. And then uh, we always pay particular attention to avoiding infection. So we give antibiotics. Everyone gets antibiotics before surgery. Um, high risk patients will get a short course of antibiotics post-op. So for the hip, um, similarly, there are some limitations of the surgery. One is uh, one common reason for dissatisfaction is a little leg length discrepancy. Most patients don't have exactly the same leg lengths, even pre-op, and your brain doesn't even register it because we do have a little, a few millimeters of leeway. But if we do make the leg longer or shorter in surgery, um, and it's enough to notice some patients are dissatisfied with that. Typically, it's a pretty easy fix with a heel lift in the shoe that's shorter. Um, the other major complications that can happen are a dislocation, periprosthetic fracture, injury to the nerves, blood clot, and infection. Um, a lot of those have to do with implant position and technique with surgery, but they still can happen even after a perfect operation. So that gets us to the robotic assistance. So I use the the Mako robotic assisted surgery platform, and um, uh, I think it does make surgery slightly more position uh, more predictable in relation to the implant position and um, avoiding outliers of surgery, which often um, cause are um, the reason we have complications. So this is just one study that's pretty well known within the orthopedic community, but is from Mass Mass General, big hospital, lots of hips, eighteen hundred hips. This is basically saying, how often do we actually hit the target? And um, I will say a little caveat, the acceptable cup placement numbers there, the inclination means the kind of the inclination and the antiversion means how the, the hip socket is oriented in surgery. And there is a little bit more leeway than what this would be inclined. But for the most part, this is our target, the square. And so the fact that we have so many dots outside the target um, is is worrisome. So in my practice, you could go, you know, somewhere between 20 degrees. So I would move this square just a little bit higher and a little bit more over, but even then we miss a lot of the dots. So these dots, especially down in here, those dots can cause from significant problems. So the robotic assistance, basically we get a CT scan before surgery. Um, we put that data into a computer. In surgery, um, we basically uh, use a little probe. We rest it on your bone, and the computer takes that information and overlies it with the CT scan it already knows. So it knows where your body is, the hip or the knee, within a millimeter during surgery. So we get live feedback of where that joint is, and it helps us place the implants based on your independent 
and unique anatomy. Um, and then it also helps based on ligament balance, it helps anticipate problems we would have otherwise created with a manual surgery. Now, creating those problems is, they're not necessarily problems, but they're just um, things we need to address later in a surgery if we don't have robotic assistance. Whereas with robotic assistance, we notice that before we ever even start the actual sur surgery or the bone cuts. So it's more proactive as opposed to reactive. The robotic assistance itself actually has um, controls the depth and the, the um, kind of the boundaries of the cut as well. So it protects the, the important structures during surgery. So this is an example. This is the green is where the robot and where we have decided to put these implants prior to surgery tells us exactly how much bone we're resecting. And then we can actually stress the knee and test the ligaments uh, to get an idea of the alignment we're going to achieve, the soft tissue balance we're going to achieve uh, before we even make any cuts. And then once we like it, that's when we go ahead and make the resections. It's similar in the hip, we can position this green acetabular component kind of wherever we want, and, and we can do it to optimize the anatomy. Um, and it also helps us uh, assess the, the length of the hip, meaning how far we take it in this direction, down away from the pelvis, and the offset from the hip, how far away we take it in this direction from the pelvis. So it helps us basically position the acetabulum and create your length and offset to match the other hip. This is a partial knee replacement. Similarly, helps us position the, the femoral component and the tibial component in a position on the femur that's gonna optimize the balance in the position. So that's a little bit about the indication for surgery. So arthritis is the indication. We do non-operative treatment. Those are some details about the surgery itself. Now, what are the expectations as far as the activity level after a well-healed surgery, say three months after surgery? Ideally, it's the three Gs, so the golf, gardening, and grandkids. Um, walking and hiking, doubles, tennis, pickleball, light skiing, swimming, jogging, just things that people in the Valley generally love to do. That's why people move here. Um, we are starting to become more aggressive as the technology improves with allowing high-impact activities. Um, but historically, we've really tried to minimize that after joint replacement. So in relation to hip um, surgery, uh, does the approach matter? Um, I consider myself more of just a hip replacement surgeon. I've done all the approaches in the past. For a while in my practice, I was actually doing simultaneous anterior approach and posterior approach for patients that qualified. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because again, I, I don't think it, it matters a great deal. There is a lot of literature that the anterior approach is uh, less invasive and maybe a quicker recovery. And there is a lot of data to support that. Um, but in my own personal practice, I didn't see that much difference in the speed of the recovery. Based on the literature, there hasn't been much difference beyond six weeks. Um, in my opinion, the rate limiting step, step excuse me, for a recovery after hip or knee replacement really is the ingrowth of the bone into the metal, um, really solidly fixing the components to the bone. That process takes about three months. It takes about six weeks for it to be really sticky and, and secure. Um, so in my opinion, the first few weeks of surgery, you should take it easy anyway, no matter if you had an anterior approach, a posterior approach, or a lateral approach, even if you're feeling great, you really need to take it easy until the body has solidified those implants to the skeleton to make it stable. Um, so in general, I recommend selecting the approach, not the surgeon. I have leaned toward doing all posterior approach uh, patients for the past few years just because I didn't really see that much difference in the anterior approach, but there certainly is some data to support that it's a faster recovery. Um, with our practice doing spinal anesthetic with a regional nerve block around the hip and a posterior approach, I've found that for the most part, it's fairly similar. Um, now we do have surgeons in the group doing anterior and posterior, and I'm not really suggesting one is better than the other, but I think it's not the limiting factor of how you're gonna recover. This is an article, um, so the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, the AUKUS is one of our big, uh, it's actually our biggest group of where all the joint surgeons are a member. 
Um, and this would suggest, as I said, that there's not much difference after six weeks after surgery anyway. Um, and then in this, in this particular study, they actually found that for whatever reason, the posterior approach patients had a faster post-op recovery. There are, like I said, the, the orthopedic literature is kind of what you, you can find articles to support your position in either way, just like anything else you're trying to research. So I try not to get hung up too much on the approach. We certainly do have surgeons in the group that do anterior and do it very, very well. So is hip or knee replacement right for me? Um, again, typically the surgery with few exceptions is re reserved for those patients with bone on bone arthritis. Some patients just don't quite have bone on bone arthritis. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not gonna have pain and symptoms and things that, that do justify you seeing us. Um, you know, even 50% joint space loss on the x-ray is probably associated with pretty significant, arth you know, cartilage thinning, meniscus tearing. So injections, activity modification, over-the-counter medications, a lot of those patients can get kind of frustrated until we actually see bone-on-bone -bone arthritis to qualify for a joint replacement. Um, we have to have reasonable expectations going into surgery. You know, you're probably not going to be happy with the outcome if you're wanting to play pickup basketball, three-on-three, -three, full court, you know, trying to dunk it. That's just not really what a hip or knee replacement is designed for, but certainly golf gardening and grandkids. Um, so when to have surgery, it's very unsatisfying to hear it from me right now, but you know, when you know, and people after having gone through it, they knew when it was time, but when you're in the middle of it, that decision can be very difficult. So generally it's poor sleep. It's inability to do, to enjoy the hobbies that you like doing. It's affecting your activities of daily living, causing chronic pain or even depression and reliance on pain medication. Those are some of the most common triggers um, we typically word that in our in our notes as it's no longer responsive to at least three months of conservative measures. Um, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, you're going to do no harm in waiting um, to proceed with the joint replacement. So just to finish up, these are a few observations that I've made during um, COVID, and I would just like to share them with you. So um, you know, COVID was, we were starting to do outpatient same day surgeries even before COVID, but it took something like COVID to really make it almost be the norm. Um, during that time, we really optimized the process to the point where lots of our patients now go home the same day as an outpatient. And we have a new surgery center that I'm sure a lot of you know about, but it's a beautiful facility and it's designed really specifically to accommodate same day outpatient joint replacement surgery. And it's been very effective. Um, and then from a personal standpoint, I've noticed that the way people balance risks and benefits, um, a lot of the risks of COVID really kind of made that more transparent for me because in a way we're all hearing the same information. Now we may see it on a different news source and see it from a different perspective, but we're all essentially processing the same amount of information. And from that information, some people are adamantly in favor of masks. Some people are adamantly opposed to masks, um, you know, um, vaccinations, the same thing. So when it comes to COVID, a lot of those those decisions are kind of political, religious, community-based, whereas we don't have so much of that in joint replacement, thankfully. Um, but it still speaks to the fact that people process information differently as it relates to risks and benefits. And I found that that explains a lot to me in, you know, in making decisions for surgery. Some patients come to me and they are just begging for an operation and on the other hand, patients are very hesitant to have surgery. And I think all that stems from people um, weigh risks and benefits differently and uniquely and independently. And that's why I think this decision can really only be made in the office, sitting with a physician or a provider, talking about your goals, your expectations, your current symptoms, the limitations the arthritis is causing, your expectations and your goals of having the surgery. So it really is a very personal decision. And this trigger and this win is different for everybody. So while the topic is, is hip or knee replacement right for me, that truly is a very personal decision and one that has to be made through shared decision making. So major surgery might not be as scary as you thought, but um, that concludes the uh, formal presentation. I'm more than happy to take uh, any questions. All right, everyone. Thank you. Right, Be thank safe you. and look forward to talking with you.